hola, ¿cómo están? En este caso tenemos el honor de recibir al profesor Jonathan Glass, que es el director de la clínica Emory de Atlanta, en los Estados Unidos. Jonathan Glass es uno de los neurocientíficos más prominentes del mundo y de los más eh, jerarquizados en los Estados Unidos. En este caso nos va a hablar sobre la atención multidisciplinaria de su clínica, eh, trasladando las experiencias y también sobre los ensayos clínicos que hay actualmente en el mundo y sus comentarios al respecto. Muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros, Jonathan, nuevamente. Eh, tuvimos el placer de recibirte hace un par de años atrás en Argentina, en diferentes eh, lugares del país, eh, y para nosotros es un enorme privilegio contar nuevamente con tu palabra y con tu experiencia y con tu sapiencia para toda la comunidad argentina. Bienvenido, Jonathan, gracias. Ok, well, I'm happy to be here. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Jonathan Glass. I am the director of the Emory ALS Center in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. And uh, my friends, uh, Pablo and Dario, have asked me to give a little presentation about um, how we run our multidisciplinary clinic. And I'm going to try to do that uh, this morning. Um, and so just to start off, um, This is, this is the way we approach care. Uh, we approach care by um, combining a partnership uh, between uh, the medical professionals um, and the patients and volunteers, but um, also um, we have vendors and all kinds of uh, other folks who come into the clinic uh, to help. Anybody who's got expertise, we invite them in. And so this is the way it, it kind of looks. Uh, we say it takes a team for patient-centered care. And what you can see is right in the middle are the ALS patients and their families. And here we have the Muscular Dystrophy Association and the ALS Association um, that actually participate by not only giving us a little bit of money to support this clinic, but they come in uh, to the clinic and meet these patients and they can provide certain amount of services within their homes and in their communities that we can't provide here at the clinic. And so um, we work with them directly as uh, partners so they can tell us what's happening at home while we are taking care of them in the clinic. But as you can see, uh, surrounding uh, this uh, care team are our clinical nurses and physicians and our research nurses and staff. Um, we also have many people from uh, the rehab facility, which include physical therapists and occupational therapists. We have a nutritionist, dietitian. Um, we have a respiratory therapist, speech pathologist. We have social work um, and somebody who deals with augmentative communication with the tools that we now have to help people communicate who can't speak. Um, but also we have um, vendors and these vendors will include uh, wheelchair fitting services. And so when patients come to the clinic, they can bring their wheelchairs um, and those wheelchairs can be fixed Those wheelchairs can be uh, changed to help with the patients. They can be refitted uh, right there in the clinic. And the idea here is this is a one-stop clinic where people come and can everything, get everything they need so they don't have to go to multiple um, healthcare providers or multiple vendors. We also have an orthotist that comes to the clinic uh, to give patients um, things like foot braces, uh, hand braces, all kinds of things like that, neck braces. Um, we have volunteers that come to the clinic, uh, and these volunteers are typically family members of uh, people that we have taken care of in the past who want to give back to the community. These people are extraordinarily experienced in how to care for their loved ones at home and can give lots of advice um, to other families who are dealing with this. And possibly uh, most important are our students and fellows that come to clinic. We need to teach the next generation how to do this. Um, and so, um, We encourage our students and fellows to come and to learn and participate, which uh, many of them have told us when they go out into practice has been very helpful. Oops. So this is our team. This is just our uh, clinical team. Um, we have three physicians, uh, myself, Dr. Christina Fournier, and Dr. Uh, Rocchio Garcia uh, Santabanez, uh, who's from Ecuador, and actually she quite helps. She speaks obviously fluent Spanish, We have a big Spanish speaking uh, population up here. And so she can help uh, directly with communicating with those folks. We also have a nurse practitioner 
um, Annie Rowland, and probably the person who runs the clinic most, who works really 24 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to help these patients, is our clinical nurse, Holly Doe. We also have a team of research nurses who deal not only with helping uh, take care of patients, these, are, these three nurses are extraordinarily experienced in the care of ALS patients, but they run our research team, um, which uh, help with all of our clinical trials. And we uh, help to recruit patients for clinical trials and keep them in our clinical trials. And uh, within that are the non-medical staff that are clean, clinically research coordinators who run some of those clinical trials and are extraordinarily important in keeping all these things going. Right now, we're working on about five or six clinical trials actively, and so keeping all that, those balls in the air is sometimes um, quite a challenge, and this team does a great job. Um, we have uh, two physical therapists that, that come to the clinic, and hopefully Diane Beckwith will come on a little bit later to answer some questions. Um, we have an occupational uh, therapist, Nicole Patel, we have respiratory therapist. Uh, we have Rob and Shundalin, uh, speech and swallowing, a speech, speech pathologist, uh, extraordinarily helpful in addressing uh, whether patients are safe to swallow, whether they need peg tubes, um, and uh, whether they need strategies uh, to help with their swallowing, along with Glenn, our nutritionist, who's been with us probably since the beginning and has uh, probably learned more about the nutrition of ALS from experience in taking care of ALS patients than most nutritionists around the world. We have um, somebody who we recruited from something called Tools for Life, which is run out of one of the other universities in Atlanta. This is Krista, and Krista helps with all the um, electronics that are coming on board, the eye gaze systems, um, the new systems that are coming out that are work with both the iPad and the Android um, uh, tablets. Um, and she is very good at deciding uh, what patients need and uh, what the appropriate um, uh, uh, intervention is for them in terms of electronics. Um, we recently added uh, Lauren, who is a genetic counselor. She's a certified genetic counselor. And as you know, genetics is a big deal right now, especially now that we're doing uh, genetic um, gene therapy trials, but also we're looking for people who are at risk for a genetic type disease, and uh, she's extraordinarily important in um, doing some of that genetic counseling that's necessary before we test people. She also brings in her genetic counseling students who are learning about ALS, and uh, that's something that needs to be done uh, literally all over the world because ALS was never really something that, pay, that geneticists paid attention to, but they are now. My social worker, Michelle, uh, helps deal with family issues, uh, including um, interactions among family members, insurance issues, uh, dealing with children, um, and she's uh, very experienced uh, in that way. And then we have this team of volunteers. Um, these are just some of them uh, run by Karen Duffy. Karen came to us about 15 years ago through her children. Her two young boys um, got interested in ALS and they called me and said, what can we do for ALS? And I showed them the laboratory. I showed them what we did. And now Karen not only uh, runs our volunteer program. She runs some of our fundraising events um, and has really become a member of the team. And she brings in these other folks um, who typically have had family members associated with ALS and who come in and help us with everything uh, we need to do. Very important is our administrator. This is Ruya. Um, and Ruya makes sure the patients get to the clinic, get their appointments, um, now deal with our Zoom appointments. Uh, she's uh, very valuable. And um, uh, Michael um, deals with our database, which now has about 2,500 patients in it. We try to take all the different details of patients, all the biospecimens that we've collected, and he has created an enormous database um, where we can just go into it and see who these people are, where they are in the progress of their disease, which ones might or might not be eligible for a clinical trial, but also um, what biospecimens uh, do we have that we can share with researchers around the world. Um, that they can they can use. So it's it's a big team, and this is just the clinical team. Um, I don't have the research, the basic research team up here uh, right now. But as you can see, I don't do it myself. In fact, I couldn't do it myself. It really takes a lot of people to really make this work. And we haven't stopped. Um, we are continuing to do all multidisciplinary clinics during COVID. And again, a lot of this has been done by uh, Michael and Ria. And what you can see here is uh, banks of computers where we can actually have multiple patients 
online at the same time. They will see all the different providers that they need to see online. And what we have learned is two things. Number one, patients don't mind this. In fact, patients kind of like this. Uh, traveling in Atlanta or to Atlanta and trying to park your car and getting into the clinic is not easy for many of these folks, number one. Number two, they are comfortable in their own homes. Um, and they can have family members from anywhere in the world join into these Zoom meetings. And even though we can't physically examine them, um, we can get a sense of where they are in their disease. Uh, and in fact, Dr. Fournier has developed a um, telemedicine-based clinical examination that we're testing out now to see if we can get some real data on how people are doing. We do get um, respiratory therapists to go to people's homes so they can actually get some breathing numbers if we need it. And if they need a wheelchair, we can get our wheelchair vendors out there. We can bring them in to get them fitted for a new wheelchair. So we really haven't stopped, even though um, the COVID has uh, kept us from seeing a lot of these folks in person. So what are the therapeutic interventions that can affect survival in this disease? And uh, the one that we all know about is Riliazol. And I'm going to show you a little bit of data um, on Riliazol. Uh, respiratory care and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, or NIPPV, um, BiPAP or Trilogy or AVAPS, um, that actually makes a difference in survival, as does nutrition. Um, we've all heard about Ederavone, which has been shown to slow progression based on the ALS-FRS, um, but uh, there's really no survival data at this point. Um, there is some new data, obviously, from the Amelix folks that have just been published, um, but we're waiting to see um, how that data uh, falls out in terms of a new therapeutic. So this is the original paper um, from, from uh, Riliazol that was published back in 1994. And um, it is pretty uh, impressive stuff. And this was looking at survival, not at the ALS-FRS, which is a really subjective scale. This is actual survival. This is black and white. And uh, when you look at all patients, people on Riliazol lived longer, lived about 10% longer than people on placebo. If you look at just the bulbar onset, that difference becomes bigger. And even though there is a statistically significant difference when you look at limb onset disease, it's a bit smaller. And so you can see that the real um, uh, push in terms of the data really comes from the bulbar onset disease. And many people have poo-pooed this data over the years, uh, but in reality, this has been repeated multiple times. Um, and every time it's been looked at, uh, the people on uh, Riliazol always live longer. The idea of Riliazol was based on this data that originally came from Dr. Rothstein at Johns Hopkins, showing that excitatory amino acids, both glutamate and aspartate, are higher in patients with ALS than in controls. And um, um, what we had thought, at least at the beginning, is that what really does is really attack uh, this glutamate-mediated mediated, um, abnormal excitatory amino acid uh, metabolism. And the way that works, um, looking at uh, the neuron and um, the synapse here, uh, the connection between the upper and the lower motor neuron, um, glutamate is released and is taken up by the lower motor neuron. And it's thought that in ALS there's too much of this, and that might be due to this problem here, because astrocytes, which are really the vacuum cleaners of the synapse, take up that glutamate and, and take it away from the synapse. But if the, the astrocytes are not working well enough, there may be too much glutamate. The idea here is that really is all blocks the release of glutamate and actually reduces the amount of glutamate in the synapse, reducing excitotoxicity. Since this original work was done, we now know that Riliazol has some other effects, including it's a sodium channel blocker, and a sodium channel blocker uh, may reduce excitotoxicity as well, although many other sodium channel blockers, which really are the anti-epileptic drugs, have not worked in ALS. So we're not absolutely clear how this works, but we do know it works. And if you look at this, which is a compilation of three trials that was published back in 2007, what you see here is that if you combine all the data from these um, placebo-controlled clinical trials, you see that in each one, um, the patients on uh, Riliazol did better uh, in terms of survival. This is survival um, as opposed to the ALS-FRS uh, rather than placebo. So when people ask me, do I put people on Riliazol? The answer is absolutely yes. And they say, well, it's only three months. And I say, well, that's better than anything else that's ever been shown, number one. And number two, maybe it's not three months for some people. 
um, I could say it's 10% because that's what the data really shows. It's, it's a 10% difference. And depending on how your disease is progressing, um, 10% may be a lot, maybe a little. Um, but um, this is up to the patient in terms of um, survival. And I think it's important. But let's look at this. Um, this is NIPPV and NIPPV, um, which we call BiPAP or we call Trilogy now. Um, or AVAPS, um, which is a computer-controlled uh, type of um, interaction with the breathing system. And this has been shown time again to improve survival. And you can see here from a paper from 1999 and another one from 2003, um, that people on um, um, NIPPV um, actually live longer and also have a better quality of life. Um, and you can see even that if you look at their ALS FRS R, you can see that that tends to improve in patients uh, with uh, on a non-invasive ventilation. Uh, BiPAP uh, has a single setting, meaning that it has the same pressure going in as the pressure going out and does not adjust itself. Um, the respiratory therapist or the physician needs to address those pressures to deal with how the patient is uh, level of comfort or in terms of um, the patient's uh, changing needs as the disease progresses. What the AVAP system do, do and the Trilogy system does, it's a computer controlled um, volume control. And so what it does here is it actually adjusts its pressure in and its pressure out based on getting a specific volume in uh, to the patient's lungs. And uh, patients tend to find this a little bit more comfortable. And we also find that we need to adjust it much less frequently as the patient uh, progresses. The other thing we use in terms of um, um, uh, treatment of respiratory care is something called the cough assist or insufflation exufflation. This is a machine uh, that very um, quickly blows in a pressure of air and then sucks it out very quickly. It's an artificial cough. Um, this does so multiple things. What it's meant to do and what it does very well is to clear the lungs of excess mucus um, and secretions uh, that are typically um, uh, cleared by us coughing. Um, we generate uh, pressure with coughs, but people with ALS clearly cannot generate um, the same kinds of pressures. But what it also does is inflate the lungs, allow, allows the lungs to stay clean and open and prevents uh, the um, collapse of the lung sacs or atelectasis. Um, it's usually well tolerated. Um, there's no good control data showing this is good, but I can tell you that patients uh, tend to love it. So um, let's look at nutrition now. That's the other thing that uh, improves survival. Um, and the risk of malnutrition in ALS is obvious to anybody who's actually uh, seen an ALS patient or cared for an ALS patient. Um, patients uh, have difficulty with swallowing. They have weakness in their extremities, and so they can't necessarily get to food to their mouth so they can't feed themselves and they develop spasticity around their mouth so it's difficult uh, to actually open their mouth to get food into it. Also, uh, respiratory insufficiency uh, makes it difficult to breathe. We eat and we breathe through the same hole in our face, our mouth um, or our nose. And um, so when you're uh, eating and swallowing, you cannot breathe. And so people who have respiratory insufficiency um, tend to not want to eat because they don't want to um, swallow and actually block their airways so they can't breathe. In fact, the brain tells, um, tells you, I'm not hungry when it really needs air because um, uh, breathing will always take precedence over eating. And that's a problem because the other problem here is that when you become malnourished, that will compromise breathing. It becomes a vicious circle. Um, and a large percentage of our calories that go in every day goes to breathing. Breathing takes a lot of work. Um, we do breathing with large muscles 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so um, uh, what we need to do is have plenty of calories to do that. Um, and so if you're losing calories, you're actually going to have less, fewer calories um, to do your breathing. And also we know that ALS is what we call a hypermetabolic state, meaning that we burn more calories sitting still with ALS than normal. And we don't understand that. There's a fair amount of research going on here. It's not clear why this happens. It's not just fasciculations. It's not just loss of muscle. Um, but for some reason, um, 
a patient's uh, idle tends to go up and tends to burn calories more frequent, uh, more calories sitting still than normal. Uh, so we tend to uh, monitor the nutritional state right from the start and we correlate it with respiratory function. Uh, we do this by very simple means. Uh, we do it by weighing patients. And if patients start to lose weight, we tell them not to do it. We tell them not to go to low calorie foods anymore. If they're on um, uh, kind of low fat diets because of cardiac disease, depending on what their disease looks like, uh, we say, well, that may not be so important uh, at this point rather than uh, not losing weight. And so we ask patients to weigh themselves probably once every week or every two weeks. Um, and if they start to lose weight to get more calories in. And then we're very aggressive in terms of getting in uh, gas, uh, gastrostomy tubes or PEG tubes. Um, and we do it even, quote, before it is needed. And these are the kinds of things we look at. We look at vital capacity of less than 50% are predicted. Why do we do that? Because if we wait too long after that, um, patients become surgical risks. This should be a very simple procedure that occurs probably in about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but if you have compromised breathing, it becomes much more of a dangerous procedure. So we tend to do it early. If patients lose weight and can't keep their weight up, um, then we get them a peg tube. But also if they risk aspiration, if they're starting to get um, uh, food or saliva or uh, water stuck into their lungs because of aspiration and uh, give them the risk of pneumonia, uh, what we do is we get them a peg tube so the majority of their calories can get in uh, through a peg tube. And we have um, a very expert nutritionist and an expert general surgeon. Um, this guy, Ed Lind, can put a peg in to almost anybody. And um, he will do pegs that other uh, physicians won't. And he's extraordinarily uh, um, dedicated to this ALS population. Uh, he's been a great partner for us and for our patients. Um, what you can see at the bottom here, um, um, that um, if you uh, look at the number at risk um, in terms of um, getting a peg tube and not the patients getting a peg tube uh, tend to do better in the long run. Although if you look at it, um, patients getting a peg tube are typically later in their disease. So it's very difficult uh, to do a clinical trial in peg tube to see whether it improves survival. We've tried several times. It's hard to do. Uh, um, there are therapies on the horizon, um, and these include um, gene therapies. Um, these are ones that we're doing right now, and this includes the SOD1 antisense uh, trial, um, which is uh, a trial that is being run by Biogen. Um, this is an antisense oligonucleotide, meaning it's a um, small piece of genetic material that binds uh, to RNA to stop um, the SOD1 protein from being made. Um, and there was a publication in July in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that it slowed progression in the highest doses in patients who had the fastest progression. The caveat there that that was really only for patients uh, compared to for placebos. Um, having said that, uh, the data is pretty impressive that these patients just tended to stop getting worse. Um, there's another trial coming down the pike from another company where, which will use microRNAs to actually turn off um, this uh, SOD1 gene as well. Um, and uh, we're hopefully to get that started uh, maybe by the first of next year. The most common genetic mutation uh, causing familial ALS is the CNINORF72 mutation. Again, there is an antisense oligonucleotide trial going on right this second. Um, this is an earlier trial than the SOD1 trial. We haven't seen any results yet. Um, but again, uh, there are dozens of patients in this trial. They are receiving uh, uh, monthly doses of an antisense oligonucleotide um, to turn off uh, this C9RF72 gene. And if you know about the biology of this, uh, this is what's called a hexanucleotide repeat. And what, this, uh, what the antisense is focusing on is that hexanucleotide repeat to keep that from being um, translated into the abnormal proteins. So we're hoping to see if that works as well as the SOD1 works. There are also some monoclonal antibodies that are being developed uh, to try to attack the C9RF72. Um, those have not come to clinical trial yet, but we're watching that. And a new trial that has just started within the last 
couple of weeks is uh, called the ataxin 2 trial. By the way, all three of these are be do being done by Biogen. Um, and this is an antisense oligonucleotide to this protein or this gene called ataxin 2. What's interesting about this is this is not specifically for genetically based disease, SOD1 or C9RF72, but in fact for sporadic disease, people who don't have a genetic mutation. And this is based on the science uh, that's come out mostly from California from a guy named Aaron Gittler, showing that ataxin 2 is a protein that interacts with another protein called TDP43, which is a protein that seems to be important for almost all patients with ALS especially in sporadic disease. And at least in animal models, when you knock down a taxin 2, um, TDP43 is reduced, the, abnormal, the abnormalities are reduced, and at least the mice that have been treated tend to live much longer. So this is a really exciting trial that potentially will be amenable uh, to treating disease in the much larger sporadic population than in the, um, in the genetic population. Um, <clears throat> We uh, have heard about this um, thing called AMX0035 from uh, the company called Amelix, a company that was started literally by two college students um, several years ago. And this combines uh, two drugs that were tried previously, sodium phenylbutyrate and turoursodiol, which is another name for this is called Tudka. And what they have shown, uh, again, in a New England Journal article that was published several months ago, is that it slows disease according to the ALS FRSR, but just this week published in Muscle and Nerve showed that the people who were on the drug versus the people on placebo um, showed that they actually survived longer. So that's the big news this week, that this drug seems to not only improve progression, but improve survival. This has not gone to the FDA yet, and so we don't know whether uh, this drug will be approved or whether a new trial uh, will be needed. Uh, the new um, kind of trial design, not necessarily new trial, but new trials, but the new trial design is called the Healy Platform Trial. And this is kind of an interesting approach to clinical trials. Whereas before we did clinical trials where we had one drug and one placebo, and you'd either be on a drug or a placebo, and every time you wanted to do a new drug, you'd create a new protocol, you'd create a new contract, you'd create a new um, outcome measure, we create everything new every time. What this does is create a single uh, protocol to do, a pl to do a clinical trial, and then it tends to add drugs to it as we go along. The companies who want to participate in this have to agree that they will uh, approve this trial design, but we actually have several companies that are already interested. And the advantage here is that we can try four drugs simultaneously. Now, patients don't get four drugs, they get one of four drugs or they get a placebo. So there are five choices that they can be randomized to. But this means that we're trying four drugs at the same time against one placebo. So if you think about it, your chance of getting a placebo instead of maybe two to one or one to one is now four to one. And patients like this because they're much less likely uh, to get the placebo and patients don't necessarily wanna be on the placebo. Right now, there are uh, four drugs being tried an anti-inflammatory, an antioxidant, what's really interesting, uh, col a colloidal gold uh, preparation, which uh, goes after the mitochondria, very interesting data, and another uh, neuroprotective uh, drug that's going after a, a receptor called the sigma-1 receptor. And all of these are ongoing right now, and uh, patients are being um, uh, randomized at 54 centers across the United States right now. And we hope to get data very quickly on these drugs. And then if one drug fails, you just replace it with another one on the line. And so that's really uh, interesting. It's faster, it's more efficient, and eventually it will be cheaper. So what else can we do with this comprehensive ALS clinic? Um, in fact, what it does is it feeds the science. And um, this, is a, this is a slide I really like to show, not only because um, it shows my ability to create a PowerPoint slide, um, but it actually shows how we interact with the basic research teams. So if you create a comprehensive clinic with all those different features that I've already shown you, um, you create a reputation for having an excellent uh, clinic where patients get very, very good care. If you have a great reputation, you get referrals um, from more physicians, and we now get referrals not only from around the Southeast, but we get referrals from around the country and around the world. 
and those referrals feed back to that comprehensive ALS clinic, which makes it grow. Um, and then you can generate clinical data that is all in our database now, uh, where we need our data manager to generate all that, uh, to store all that clinical data in a way that we can retrieve it. We create a DNA repository and we can ha now have data on epidemiology based on all of the different exposures these patients may have had, uh, what their ages are, where they live, all kinds of uh, epidemiologic questions can be answered. And that actually creates multi-site collaborations. And we've taken this DNA and all of our clinical data and we've contributed it to something called Project MINE, which is a 15, uh, 15 country collaboration looking at whole genome sequencing in patients with uh, ALS. Um, we've actually worked uh, with other universities um, in Europe, uh, in Australia, and across the United States, um, sharing all these data and all these biospecimens. And it also feeds the bench science that goes on here and goes on elsewhere, uh, giving DNA and actually, um, I didn't put it on here, but also our autopsy uh, bank of uh, patients with ALS where we have brain and spinal cord tissue um, from these patients. Um, and that leads uh, to uh, research on mechanisms of disease. Some uh, ideas here that, that this is certainly not uh, all the ideas. We look at protein misfolding, oxidative stress, genetic susceptibility to disease. We spend a lot of time on that and possibly even environmental exposures. And this is not only important for ALS, but we do know that there are common themes among other neurodegenerative diseases, including Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, and even Huntington's disease. Um, and from there, um, we can generate novel therapeutics. Um, we're already doing that. Um, and that feeds back to the, uh, to the clinic where we can actually do clinical trials. And so um, you can see here that if you want to do uh, science in ALS, whether it be clinical science or best si bench science, you really need the patients uh, to do that. I can tell you that animal models and cell models of ALS are useful, but they're not the real disease. The real disease happens in humans, and humans need to be studied so we can understand the disease in the real uh, people who have that disease. And I can tell you, at least in my experience, patients are very, very willing to participate. In fact, this morning, not only did I do a spinal tap on a patient with an SOD1 ALS, but I asked her whether I could do a skin biopsy so I can grow her cells and make iPS-derived motor neurons from her? And she said, absolutely. Take what you need, do what you need. And that's, that's been the partnership we have with our patients. So that's my presentation. Um, oh, one more thing. Uh, as I said before, very important, our clinical training. We're training medical students. We're training uh, uh, students in genetic counseling or physical therapy or occupational therapy. Um, we're training undergraduate students, PhD students, uh, MD-PhD students. And again, we need to train the next generation. Uh, I don't pretend to believe that I am the last ALS clinician that's going to be out there. At some point, I'm going to need to be replaced, and we need uh, replacements uh, to come sit in my chair and um, uh, all the chairs that are around the world. So that's extraordinarily important. So um, that's going to generate uh, research grants, training grants. Uh, we get money from philanthropy. And obviously, if we make a big discovery, we can generate patents. That brings in more money that we can do more research. So I'm going to stop that now and ask uh, for your questions. Excellent presentation. Thanks for that. It was, it was really exciting. A, a lot of exciting things there. And así que, bueno, vamos a empezar con las preguntas, OK? Diane um, has been a physical therapist working with me, Diane, longer than I can remember. It's got to be close to 20 years, um, don't you think? It has. Yeah. I think I came here before you. <laughs> yeah. You joined the ALS clinic right from the beginning. Um, and so I would argue that Diane may be one of the most experienced physical therapists in the world in terms of how to get patients with ALS. Um, she has seen more than a thousand patients with ALS um, and yeah. dealt with all the problems that they have. And so instead of me answering questions about physical therapy, which I would just make up the answer, um, Diane can probably give you some really authoritative answers. ¿Quién tiene una pregunta para hacer? ¿Quién quiere levantar la mano primero? Eh, no, yo más que nada quería eh, decir, ¿no? Porque yo estoy ahora, inició una kinesiología, o sea, me están haciendo masajes. 
y a la vez eh, me hacen electrodos. Este, yo no sé si será porque yo quiero ver, o, pero no, yo, yo eh, me siento como que estoy recuperando un poco de, de masa muscular. O sea, yo quería saber eso más que nada, si está bien lo que estoy haciendo, porque eh, vamos a ser sinceros, me automediqué más que nada, porque probé con esto y bueno, eh, veo que, que me está haciendo, o sea, veo resultados a mí. Um, he had mentioned um, having electrical stimulation, I think. Is that correct? Yes, he did. Yeah. Um, my assumption that the, the improvement is because he, his muscle tissue is still responding to an external source. Um, in the long run, it is uh, probably not likely, and maybe Dr. Glass can butt in on this answer, and that is um, that, that he's probably not going to see long-term changes as a result of the electrical stim because the nerves are just not there. Um, so, so it's sort of going to be an artificial way to maintain um, some, some strength. Um, if there is still viable muscle tissue there. So that's something that we don't really do in the United States is to do electrical stim. Um, but that being said, if he, he's noticing a change, then um, that's a good thing. And he may um, be able to use his arm hand more. Um, so, um, yeah, I, um, the other answer to that question is physical therapy is certainly valuable as long as we can offer the patient some changes to their function. You know, can we assist with, um, you know, keeping joints flexible so that, you know, they can move easier? Um, and we do a lot of prescription of equipment so that things make are made easier. Um, Diane, can you, make, can you make a comment about the importance of a physical therapist in terms of fitting of a power wheelchair? Yeah, so that, um, that goes beyond, that, that's part of the equipment uh, uh, gamut. Um, you know, we look at braces initially um, to help walking. Um, then assistive devices such as canes and walkers. Um, and then once uh, that is no longer a realistic um, thing to use for mobility, then um, we do um, the power wheelchair prescriptions. We try to do them fairly early because in the United States, it takes a couple of months before funding can be secured for such a device. Um, so um, sometimes the patients are not very um, ready, so to speak, for um, that to happen. But we try to encourage them to, you know, stay ahead of the game in terms of being able to function in the home. And so um, the other thing I would like to say is that patients probably shouldn't um, just go out and buy their own wheelchair. Um, wheelchairs. Um, especially late in the disease, are extraordinarily important in terms of comfort and size and the other features you can put on a wheelchair. And so just buying one um, may not be the best thing. And so I think, Diane, um, one of your expertise is making sure patients get the right wheelchair. Is that correct? Yeah, so it, uh, we, um, we have an uh, issue in, in in the insurance industry that you know um they're they're not likely to pay for multiple devices over you know a, a, a short period um so the guideline is if this device is going to help them for a five-year time period that's what the insurance company is looking at is you know we'll fund it for five years um, that being said, if the patient has like a short, um, if it has a slow progression, then, then it might be okay in some instances to buy something that is an inexpensive thing um, and then get the more comfortable and um, multiple position chair for um, later on. 
the most part we get get a power chair with tilt recline power elevating legs um, from the start because of the issue with being afraid that the insurance will deny if we get something um, else earlier so it means replacing the whole chair in order to add tilt recline power elevating legs so michelle hammond sustin is here hey michelle there's michelle hey. michelle um, is a social worker who's been working with us again for more than a decade it's i i, I can't remember right it's probably about 2007 2008 okay. mm -hmm. so and again has seen hundreds and hundreds of patients and families with als and has dealt with all the difficulties um that go along in fact um when i hear about a patient and a family having problems i say go to michelle because i can't solve it and she's extraordinary so michelle this is the group from argentina okay michelle welcome welcome here thank you so much for being here in this in this teleconference uh it's a pleasure to meet you quien más tiene alguna pregunta nos está aconteciendo que eh, la paciente a veces eh, no quiere o o no desea eh, reconocer lo que está pasando, digamos, quiere continuar su vida cotidiana normal y lamentablemente ya han sido varias ocasiones que, 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 que se ha caído al piso, eh, que se ha golpeado la cabeza, eh, que quiso agarrar una, una olla y se le cayó. Entonces ya, digamos, hay ciertos riesgos que se están comenzando a correr como, digamos, como, como consecuencia. Y digo, más que nada una, una, una sugestión porque lo, lo que nosotros pensamos es colocar un cuidador todos los días porque en la familia eh, todo el personal, tra todo, toda la familia trabaja, eh, digamos, pensamos en una silla de ruedas porque realmente la tierra está afectando demasiado. Eh, no sé, no sé qué, 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 qué consejo nos pueden dar a, eh, para tratar esta parte, digamos, no sé, llamarla psicológica. Great. So, um, the first thing I would say is, is that Denial is a coping mechanism that's a normal part of the, the grief process. And what is ALS in general? We go through an extended period of a grief process with loss of independence, um, potentially looking forward to the future of our own mortality, things like that. So um, while denial can be kind of the ability to uh, give our our body and our brain extra time to process a really distressing situation um, It can be harmful in terms of what they're asking the question about is you know with ongoing safety issues if denial sticks with us too long um, so I would usually say up front one of the primary things for families to do is knowledge is power so it's great that they're asking questions and getting educated about how they can be helpful even if mother-in-law isn't currently on the same page about um, where she is with the disease progress um, the second part i think is validating that experience of um, it must be really hard to be experiencing this. Um, that's something I think that's really productive for family members to be able to say um, in a way that sometimes people dealing with ALS um, can hear. Um, so that's a good starting point, I think, is to acknowledge what's underneath of denial. And again, oftentimes I'll hear from people the idea of the biggest one is loss of independence or loss of control around their own life. Um, the second one is kind of the idea that if I give up, if I, if I acknowledge that I need more help, I'm giving up or giving in to the disease. Um, and then kind of the third piece is probably the idea of um, if I acknowledge it, then that makes it real. Um, so by kind of delving into what's underneath that denial, it's helpful, I think, 
um, to kind of get a better understanding of what the person who's living with ALS is experiencing and maybe to help them get some insight into what's underneath that as well. Um, so I like the idea of, again, validating. Um, I understand that this must be really difficult for you. Um, I'm wondering, given the circumstances that maybe we've had increased falls or um, something safety related, if, if we can maybe help keep you as independent as possible, what would that look like? So it's giving the person with ALS the ability to kind of step back from it a little bit and to do it maybe for them to think through what might be helpful instead of um, we oftentimes as caregivers or family members or loved ones want to say, you need to stop doing this because this is dangerous. And I think just by having loss of control already, that that can feel uh, really daunting to have somebody tell you you can't be doing something. Um, so being able to step back from it a little bit and say, how can we help you stay as independent as possible for as long as possible? Um, and usually I think that's an ongoing conversation that needs to happen. So um, picking a time and a place and when people are in kind of the best emotional space to have those conversations is really important. So, you know, if, if it's in the heat of, oh my gosh, she almost fell, it's probably not the best time to have that conversation right then. Um, but to schedule a time where you can kind of talk through some of those kind of issues, I think is helpful. So I, uh, just to add to that, Michelle, um, you said something that I say to patients all the time, and I'm glad Diane is on, because um, they think that they're going to use equipment that Diane is going to give them, whether it be a walker or an AFO or a wheelchair, they're giving into the disease. And I say, no, 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 you're fighting the disease. And this is what we have to fight the disease to keep you as independent as possible for as long as possible. And so it fits into the psychology. And I think what you said was perfect, which is, I don't want to stop you from doing anything. I want to help you to keep doing things and do them safely. So um, we hear that all the time, Diane, I know we do. I don't want a wheelchair. Why? Because I'm not ready. And then they fall down and break their hip. Um, so it's a really important point that you made. And it's a great, I think, tool. The multidisciplinary clinic is a great tool to address that um, because you have multiple providers saying it in different ways over the course of the day and over the course of months to help people get ready um, and to break through some of that denial as we go along. Um, so I think that's important too. Yeah, awesome. I know that some patients... They don't want to listen to what I have to say, but when you say it, or when Diane says it, or when Nicole says it, they go, okay, that's fine, or it's Holly. It's really great to have a team of people who are extraordinarily experienced, um, and that way I don't have to know everything, which I know I don't. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was really, really helpful. So, uh, John, uh, would you like to continue with the rest of the questions? I'm happy to do that. Yep. Bueno, mi nombre es Pablo Gatti, eh, yo soy paciente de ELA, fui diagnosticado en mayo del 2019, eh, y le quería preguntar eh, al doctor Glass si en su clínica y con todos los casos que él ve, puede decir, eh, o, o tiene un promedio en mente, eh, de la velocidad eh, a la cual eh, la escala de ALS, eh, FRS, o sea, la escala ALS, FRS, eh, se va modificando a lo largo del tiempo. O sea, un, un promedio que él tenga, puede decir, se pierden tantos puntos por mes, Yo, como algo que tenga en mente, si eso es posible, o si la variedad de casos que él ve no le permite eh, tener ese número en la cabeza. Gracias. It's a, it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure if there's a great answer. Um, so if you look at the literature and you look at clinical trials, um, we look at the average uh, patient going at about one point per month. And in fact, for some of the clinical trials, including the Tofersen trial, um, at least the Valor trial, when you're looking for patients who are 
more rapidly progressive, which are the ones that we think we may get more data from in terms of whether they respond to treatment, um, we tend to include patients in trials that are at least 0.5 per month. Um, so the average is, is one point per month. Um, and uh, um, we tend to, to look at progression of 0.5 per month as, as a, at least a, a progression that we can put somebody in a clinical trial. Now, I'm gonna use this opportunity to advertise something different. Um, the thing about the ALS FRSR is that it's not a linear scale. Um, and so Pablo, um, who has had the ALS FRSR used for him in his Tofersen trial, knows that there are 12 questions and there are four potential answers to each question, 48 points. Um, but they all go in, in different um, uh, regions or different, different um, disability areas uh, in patients with ALS. So one point in walking doesn't necessarily equal one point in eating, doesn't necessarily equal one point in breathing. And so when you're going at one point per month, the question always comes up is, which point is it? Um, is it the point in breathing? Is it the point in walking? Is it the point in climbing stairs? Is it the point in cutting your food? Which are all the different questions. And so it's a non-linear scale. Um, so a point in one of those questions doesn't necessarily equal a point in one of the other questions. So my colleague here, Dr. Fournier, has developed a new, um, what we would call a linear scale that is mathematically driven um, and developed called the Rhodes scale using a, um, something called Rausch analysis. Rausch analysis is a way of creating questionnaires that are linear as opposed to uh, nonlinear. And what it does is it takes questions that go from the hardest to the easiest in terms of function and see um, what patients can actually can do and can't do. As opposed to four different answers, there's basically, I can't do it, I can do it, but not as well as I could do it before, or I can do it the same way I can do it before. And what it's been shown, and she's published this now, is that this is a very linear scale that changes one point um, equals one point in terms of whatever question you're answering. And so um, the LSFRSR has been the gold standard for us over the years. I think things might be changing. Um, my, my vote is for the road scale, um, but in fact, there are some electronic types of things that are going to be coming on board pretty soon, including speech applications um, or movement applications that may be more quantitative um, and may be good um, uh, measures uh, that we can do repeatedly over time um, so we can actually see progression. So the simple answer to your question is one point per month. The complicated question, answer to your question is, we got a long way to go in terms of measuring progression. Um, si hubiera fue diagnosticado, diagnosticada hace dos meses, eh, digamos que, que la enfermedad está evolviendo muy rápido. Eh, de alguna manera estamos muy preocupados. Eh, y también me gustaría preguntar, eh, ¿por qué es que en algunas personas la evolución es tan rápida eh, ¿Cuál sería ese factor? Si, si, si son mismo las células o si es mismo la, la persona y, o si tienen algún momento que, que estabiliza esta, esta, eh, o el ELA en, en las personas, si llega a un ciclo donde estabiliza o, o, o realmente es así, digamos, eh, que va, que va solo, solo empeorando, por decirlo de una manera. Great question. Um, and I hope you are my grant reviewer when, you, when I put in my grant, because this is what we're really focusing on. Why are people so different? Why is this such a heterogeneous disease? Why do some people have rapid disease? Some people have slow disease. Some people have early onset disease. Some people have late onset disease. Um, why does a genetically based disease look exactly for the most part like a non-genetically based disease? These are all really important questions. Um, and so um, I don't know what the factors are that make, that make progression fast or slow. What I said previously is that we do know that if you're on Ruyazol and if you watch your um, nutrition and keep your weight up and you use the breathing machine, the NIPPV machine, um, that actually slows progression a bit and will make you live longer. But that is an intervention. The real question, what's the biology? Um, 
what are the things that make things faster or slower? And we believe, at least I believe, and my colleagues believe who work with me on this, is that there are other genetic factors. Um, we are looking for what are called modifying genes. Genes that people are carrying that make them have fast progression or slow progression disease, or have early onset, late onset. I can tell you that even with people who have familial disease with an SOD1 mutation or a C9ORF mutation, they can be widely different, even in the same family. And so um, those are great questions. And in fact, those, I would argue that that's kind of the holy grail of this whole thing. What makes this, what lights the fire and what makes it burn as fast as it does? Um, now, your second question really is, does it always get worse? I have the simple answer to that question is yes. The simple answer to that question is yes. Having said that, there are exceptions to that rule. I have some patients I've been taking care of, and remember, I take care of thousands of patients, I have anyway, that for some reason stop. Um, I have one guy who has clearly has ALS by all measures, um, but over the last five years, he hasn't moved a bit, not a bit. And I keep seeing it back. I go, I don't understand this. Is this really ALS? And I go back and I look for other things. I can't find anything. But he meets all the criteria for ALS, but he stops. There are some patients who will get very, 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 very severely um, um, disabled and then stop. They don't die. They, are, um, they don't go on a ventilator necessarily. Um, and they just stop getting worse. Um, I don't understand that either. So um, there are patients who stop getting worse. I wouldn't bet on that because that's a very, very small percentage of patients, um, but it happens. Hola, ¿qué tal? Yo soy terapista ocupacional y estoy trabajando en una clínica de rehabilitación y estoy atendiendo un paciente con ELA. Entonces quería saber un poco cómo están trabajando allá eh, los terapistas ocupacionales, pero también en forma interdisciplinaria, el, el tema de la comunicación, si hay algún tips en particular que están teniendo en cuenta en, en este, eh, este tipo de personas, ¿sí? eh, si hay algo para recomendar. Gracias. So I have an answer for you, Sonia, from Nicole Patel, who is our occupational therapist, again, an expert in the, in the care of ALS. And um, Diane is still on because I can tell you that you ask whether they interact with other disciplines and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, they interact, Diane and Nicole interact all the time um, and Nicole will interact with uh, the folks with, um, who do uh, technology and even with nutrition in terms of getting food to people's mouths. So what Nicole says is occupational therapy is focused on assessing the patient's ability to perform the activities of daily living and um, the bilateral upper extremity functions. Um, depending on the individual's needs, uh, Nicole focuses education on the following areas. Energy conservation, compensatory strategies focused on alternate positioning, like resting arms on tables instead of reaching overhead, adaptive equipment such as cuffs, universal cuffs, button hooks, built up utensils, adaptive clothing, using Velcro, things like that, durable medical equipment, like a tub bench, a, a bedside commode, a bidet, um, all kinds of things like that, and maintaining safety and independence. She educates on contraindications for resistive exercises, increasing focus on stretching and range of motion to reduce spasms, the risks of frozen shoulders, which is a big deal, and I pay a lot of attention to people moving their shoulders so it doesn't freeze when it sits at their side because that can be a painful thing that's difficult to treat. Um, and looking at contractures, especially in the fingers, um, and we really, really try to avoid anybody having contractures in the fingers. Splinting to reduce wrist, uh, wrist drop, um, uh, contractures in the hand and fingers, she says, and recommendations for cervical collars if they have head drop due to weakness. And Nicole says, I do collaborate with other members of the team, especially physical therapy and speech therapy to address safety and functional mobility, wheelchair positioning, swallowing and eating, oral care, use of adaptations to access uh, communication devices if hand weakness is present. So um, hopefully that answers your question. I don't know if Diane has anything to add to that um, in terms of how you interact with Nicole. Um. Well, Nicole and I are usually um, together when we're in the comprehensive clinic. So um, the 
the question um, is, you know, where where is the dichotomy? And there there is not much of a dichotomy between a, occupational therapy and physical therapy. We kind of share responsibility for keeping um, the patients um, educated in range of motion exercises. Um, so uh, we collaborate in that way. We collaborate with a, on the equipment side as well. If I notice that the person has a hand contracture or finger contractures, then I may go ahead and just order for Nico, um, you know, a set of hands, resting hand splints. Or um, I might, you know, con confer with her regarding, you know, what's the best splint to do. Um, the patients come from a, a wide range of areas. So oftentimes when they come to see us, it's a one-time visit to, you know, um, educate them as much as we can in one day on, a, on an exercise program and then the potential need for equipment in the future. Um, so I will assume the responsibility of an OT if I know that the person is only coming to see me. Yo fui diagnosticado hace solo el, el 19 de agosto, tengo la fecha como un cumpleaños, ¿viste? Eh, y empecé el tratamiento el 2 de septiembre, bastante rápido, con eh, rehabilitación, quiero decir. El tratamiento con la medicación lo empecé eh, a la semana, al toque. Y la rehabilitación a las dos semanas, el 2 de septiembre. Y la verdad es que estoy contento con la rehabilitación porque he mejorado en varios aspectos, pero igual noto que tengo mucho para mejorar y trabajar. La verdad es que me interesa mucho ver cómo se está trabajando en Estados Unidos en esta clínica integral para ver qué, qué más me pueden aportar, ¿viste? Por, por más que yo voy a un centro de rehabilitación, siento como que tengo todo aislado, ¿viste? Aunque es el mismo día, el mismo centro, todo, tengo a la fonoaudióloga, a la terapista, a la kinesióloga, y como que no estoy del todo conforme, ¿viste? Como que me falta algo. Cuando yo no voy porque es feriado y hago los ejercicios en mi casa, capaz que me siento mejor, ¿viste? Porque hago todos los ejercicios. Y ahí, ¿viste? Como que termina la hora y bueno, eh, listo, nos vemos el próximo día, la próxima clase. Entonces me gustaría, no, no tengo una pregunta puntual, pero si se puede saber cuáles son los tips que os o si tienen videos o, o tutoriales o algo donde digan hay de, determinados ejercicios que son buenos para, para este tipo de, de enfermedad, me encantaría saberlo, ¿viste? Para sumar información y poder aplicarlo. Um, that's a really important issue, and it's not an easy problem to solve. And everybody, there, there's several issues. Everybody's got their own expertise. Uh, number one, and everybody's busy. And so um, um, it's, it's difficult sometimes to keep everybody on the same page. Having said that, the way we get around that is what we call the multidisciplinary conference. And so after each uh, multidisciplinary clinic day, we all sit around a conference table. Um, we would love to have beer and wine, but we typically don't. Um, and this can sometimes go late into the into the afternoon and into the evening because we start early in the morning and we're there till late but everybody's committed and we go uh, specialty by specialty by specialty of who saw that patient to discuss with the whole group what the plans are for that patient and this feedback that happens not only from me but from others in the group um, And what's really important is our clinical nurse, um, uh, Holly, will hear about things that are happening at home, needs that sometimes patients don't even bring up to us. Our, our, um, we have uh, representatives there <clears throat> from the ALS Association 
and from the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Sometimes they can help with what's going on in the home, but also um, get, we have a loaner closet that they run. And if somebody needs a piece of equipment, the occupational therapist, um, thanks, Diane. Um, <clears throat> the occupational therapist can um, say, geez, do you have a bedside commode for this person? And say, oh yeah, we have one in the closet. Or the physical therapist can talk about a, a power wheelchair that we can use as a loner. Um, and so we all talk to each other. We make sure we do talk to each other after every clinic. Um, and we prepare for every clinic by kind of asking the patients what they might need so each of the people know that. And so it's not an easy problem to solve. And I would encourage any multidisciplinary clinic to go with a conference um, because that gets people in the same room. It gets people talking about the same patient. And that way there's communication among the different specialties. Para el doctor, ¿cuáles son los principales cuidados que, que deberíamos tener? Eh, digamos que hemos visitado varios médicos. Eh, hoy está con, trabajando con fonodióloga, trabajando con fisio, haciendo varias, varias actividades también eh, en distintos lugares. No aquí eh, en, en el interior de, Bra de Brasil donde estamos. No hay un centro eh, para hacer todas las actividades Entonces, eh, digamos que queda un poco incómodo y realmente estamos viendo que, que la evolución está siendo muy rápida y realmente no, nos preocupa un poco. Um, that's a hard question to answer. Um, and in fact, the reason we created multidisciplinary clinics um, and the reason they're useful is because you don't have to go to multiple different places at different times to get different opinions. And everybody's there at the same time. So that's the usefulness, really, of a multidisciplinary clinic. But if the question is, what are the main types of care that should take into account? Um, I think what's most important is <clears throat> nutrition, safety, and breathing. Okay. And again, it has to do with um, quality of life as well. Um, ALS should be a non-painful disease. And so um, things that can avoid pain are things like preventing falls, which can help with the physical therapist, wheelchair specialist. Um, pain can come from a frozen shoulder or contracted, contracted fingers. And you can a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. It really depends on what the needs are of the patient. But certainly breathing in terms of comfort and getting, getting um, uh, good respiratory care is really important. Um, and um, nutrition, um, making sure patients don't lose weight. And that may need to be done um, with swallowing studies um, or even with the placement of a peg tube. Um, but again, it depends on the individual patient, what those needs are um, and what's important to the patient. Um, I, you know, I can't stop this disease, nobody can at this point. But if you can keep people ind relatively independent and out of pain through the course of their disease, you've really done something good for them. So that's what I would focus on. A Martín lo, lo acompañamos en familia. Eh, empezamos a implementar los jugos a la mañana, hacer jugos eh, de pepino, de naranja, de espinaca, de, qué sé yo, para aportar un poco de energía a las mañanas. Él dice que lo hace bien además de lo que está tomando, la medicación, el rilusole y el corfetán. Eh, mi pregunta es, si el tema del consumo del glutamato, que por investigar veo lo, lo dañino que es para el cuerpo, si se hacen eh, campañas de difusión o, o si hay algo que se pueda hacer para que la gente con, conozca lo dañino que es el glutamato de... de Eh, monos, monosódico creo que es, que viene en los calditos de verdura, en las papas fritas, no digo que sea la, la exclusiva causa de esto, desde ya que no, pero cuánto eh, daña al organismo y si se, se hace a conocer esto, lo, lo malo que es. Se prueba, ¿no? So, even though glutamate is a hypothesis um, that's, that is um, supported by scientific data, Monosodium glutamate doesn't make it really to your nervous system. And so I would say in terms of your ALS, using monosodium glutamate or being exposed to monosodium glutamate, glutamate is, not, is not an issue. Now, monosodium glutamate, um, some people are allergic to it. Some people give, give some headaches. 
Um, a lot of Chinese restaurants have taken it out of their food and they tell you I have no MSG, um, but I don't think it's an issue for ALS, so I wouldn't worry about it. The most important thing about nutrition um, is not anything special um, that anybody should eat. Um, I've had people come in, they want to do, again, juicing, they want to take um, gluten-free food, they want to do only organic stuff. And that's great if that's what you want and that's what you like, but it's not going to make a difference in the course of disease. What is going to make a difference, and unfortunately I've seen this, is if you start to lose weight, which means you are nutritionally compromised. So this, I tell people who want to be on a special diet um, that, okay, that's okay, as long as it's a balanced diet with a balance of protein, carbohydrates, and fat, um, and that you don't lose weight. Um, but other than that, I don't have any specific um, recommendations in terms of nutrition. Um, having uh, the right kind of calories to make your muscles work when they still can work is really, really important. Oh, and one other comment, if I can make, people argue that they lose muscle and that's why they're losing weight. That's not the answer. No. If you're losing weight, you're nutritionally compromised. You need to actually stop losing weight. La pregunta que, que tenemos, eh, que si la hicimos en su momento al neurólogo, pero bueno, era todo muy reciente, sigue siendo todo muy reciente, estamos hablando en menos de dos meses, es claro. el tema de la posibilidad de que sea genético, entonces ahí sí les pregunto a ustedes, respecto a los test genéticos, si vale la pena, no, esa es la duda que tenemos. That's actually a, a very topical question where we're having this discussion literally on an international basis within this week I had that conversation. And um, here's the answer the way we do it. And, and again, it may be different in Argentina. Um, but um, genetic testing in this country is expensive. And um, so the way I approach genetic testing um, is my first genetic test is a really good family history. Okay, and some people don't do really good family histories. I ask you about your mother, about your father, about your uncles, about your aunts, about your brothers and sisters, about your grandparents. I, I ask every question and I try to get a sense of whether there's any evidence here that this may be a familial disease. Because the reality is the chance of having a disease gene that we know about in somebody who doesn't have a family history is, is possible, but quite small quite small, okay? And um, I, I, I would argue that a lot of the um, literature that argues that many sporadic patients have genetic mutations is they're not really sporadic patients. Somebody didn't take a really good family history. Now it happens, no doubt about it, but I don't think it happens very often. And so if you have a, certainly have a family history of ALS, I do genetic testing. Or if you have a family history of dementia, I do family testing or something that sounds like dementia or frontal temporal dementia. I genetic test, do genetic testing. I developed a program for the United States called ALS GAP or Genetic Access Program. Um, and this is run through NEALS. And basically it's free genetic testing for people who have a family history of ALS or dementia. And we, we fund this through um, uh, grants from the ALS Association, from the MDA, from Biogen, from Avexis. Um, we keep asking people for money to do this, okay? And so that's been great. We've actually tested close to 600 families so far. Now, if the question is, do I test family members of patients with ALS? The, if you don't have a family history of ALS, the chance of a, of a family member get, having a, of ALS, that's, this has been done, is actually quite small. Um, and it's not much higher than the general population that doesn't have ALS in the family. And so, no, I don't do genetic testing on them, okay? Now, if you do have a family history of ALS, um, then I think genetic testing for family members, especially for SOD1 and C9, since we're doing clinical trials in those diseases, is actually quite important. But I don't do it unless these people go through genetic counseling first, because a positive or a negative um, on that genetic testing can have all kinds of psychological effects. Um, positive, obviously, if you're positive, it changes your life because you're on high risk for the disease. A negative um, can uh, kind of give you what, what's called survivor's guilt, which is, why did my brother or sister have this and I don't have it? 
I feel bad about that. And this has been shown in Huntington's disease in the past and other genetic diseases. And so I make sure our genetic counselor is involved in that. Now, this is a different time. This is 2020 and we're moving forward toward more genetic treatments, okay? And in fact, there are many people, including some companies who are arguing for large scale genetic testing in everybody with ALS because they think that we're missing a lot of people with, with, um, with ALS genes. And my, my response to that is, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that as long as somebody pays for it. Um, because um, I'm not going to ask people um, to pay for genetic tests that are very unlikely to give them an answer. Um, I, I just don't think it's fair. Um, but if somebody's willing to pay for it, I have no problem. In fact, from a researcher standpoint, I'd love to see this done. Um, I'd love to see what the landscape is. Um, and as you know, we're doing a lot of whole genome sequencing in sporadic ALS, and we're finding some patients um, with interesting mutations or, in fact, discovering new genes that way, and that's great. Um, but in terms of clinical genetic testing, um, I think today, at this point, I focus it on people who have at least a reasonable family history of a genetically based disease. Um, and um, if somebody else is willing to pay for everybody to have gene testing, I'm all for it. Uh, but right now we're not there. So I take DNA on everybody. So I store DNA on everybody. And since I do that, I do C9 testing on everybody. Okay. So I can tell you, I've done, I think I have 1200 C9s that I've done, um, on everybody. And I think I've found one, two where I didn't have a family history of disease, that I didn't already know that they had a family history of disease. Okay, so that's how rare it is. Um, and so um, I don't, I'm not against genetic testing. Um, I just don't think it's, it's a useful test um, if it's not called for and if it's not paid for. Um, if we had an approved treatment for SOD1 ALS, would you test every patient for SOD1? And I, the answer was yes. So the most important thing to actually test for a gene mutation is to have a treatment for it. And I think Orla, that was her answer, right? You don't want to miss anybody, right? So if you had a treatment for a certain type of cancer and you had to do a genetic test for see if that patient had that certain gene mutation in that cancer, you would test for it because you have a treatment. And same thing here. So I would not want to miss a patient. Cuando él vio las, las expectativas de terapias en el horizonte, eh, no mencionó las terapias con células madre, en cuyo, donde hay una gran expectativa vinculada a los próximos resultados de, de Neuron, de la empresa Brainstone. Queríamos saber eh, qué opinión tiene él al respecto. So the, the therapies I put up on that slide were the ones that had clinical data that argued that they work, okay? That there is a positive effect. And um, the data that has been presented by, by Brainstorm for Neuron, I think has shown safety, but I don't think it's shown a clinical effect at this point. Now, maybe they will show a clinical effect. I don't know, um, but that's why I didn't put it up there. Um, our stem cell trial, we really didn't prove a clinical effect. Clive Svensson's trial has not shown a clinical effect. Um, um, the folks in Italy have not shown a clinical effect. And so it's not that I'm against stem cells. Certainly not. I mean, I spent a lot of my life doing that. Um, but I don't think there's any great data arguing that it works. Um, and I don't care what the news releases are from Brainstorm. Um, I still don't think there's any data that says it works. So. Um, That's my answer. Um, as soon as they show me data that actually is believable um, and shows a clinical effect that I can believe, then I'll put it on the list. Um, but I haven't seen that yet. Eh, es una, una buena pregunta. Saber en su clínica que sabemos que además que hace este, atención clínica básica, en su momento estaba haciendo cuando vino a la Argentina, nos había hablado de, de una investigación con células madre en su, en su clínica. No sé ahora, eh, 
and get okay. started. We have a big grant um, uh, in collaboration with the folks at the Mayo and at Johns Hopkins looking at um, biomarkers in C9. And so what we're doing is um, there, there are three groups involved. It's a big grant. And the folks down at the Mayo, run by Len Petroselli, um, are doing mouse models um, of C9. Uh, and um, we're doing human proteomics on C9. And the folks up at Hopkins are doing iPS-derived neurons C9 stuff. And it's all going to come together. Um, and the way we're, what we're doing is so we have a certain expertise in proteomics here. And so what we're going to do is look for biomarkers um, by looking at motor cortex um, of patients with C9 ALS versus sporadic ALS um, versus controls and um, doing what we call network analysis and comparing basically, I think we're doing 56 brains from here and 56 brains from the Mayo Clinic and looking at the um, proteins that come out that are potential biomarkers. But at the same time, we're going to look at the mice and see whether there's any overlapping um, uh, proteins that come out as potential biomarkers, which would suggest that two things. Number one, that the mouse reflects the human, which would be good. And number two, that there's um, that this is possibly something that rises above the noise of all the different proteins that are going to be different. But then what we're going to do is we're going to choose a specific number of proteins, and then we're collecting spinal fluid um, from patients with C9 and from patients who are carrying C9 mutation, but not patients, people who have C9 mutations but don't have disease yet. These are asymptomatic C9 carriers. And we're going to look for changes in the C9 patients versus the C9 carriers that may argue that this is a change that happens when somebody actually gets sick. So that's, that's a big project that's happening in the lab. At the same time, I'm working with a guy named John Landers up at UMass with a graduate student in my lab looking at um, or, uh, genetic modifiers. So what we're doing is whole genome sequencing, looking for um, genes that may reflect the different phenotypes of patients. Um, we've done this once already. We published a paper a few years ago taking two very early onset C9 patients to two late onset C9 patients, comparing them, doing whole genome sequencing, finding differences, uh, choosing those differences, and making fly models to see whether they actually can affect the pathology in a fly. And once that was done, to actually find a potential marker um, that, that suggests this is an influencer of what makes somebody an early onset versus a late onset. So that's the kind of um, stuff we're doing in the lab right now. Um, we're still working a little bit on axons and neuromuscular junctions. Um, and I'm doing some TDP43 work as well in, in human uh, tissue. Si hay algo nuevo en la atención clínica que él está eh, como algo novedoso para la atención de personas con ELA. No sé si lo dijo antes o, o existe algo que él pueda dar como novedad o novedoso para el tratamiento clínico de las personas con ELA. No, um, there, no is, there is a woman um, named Emily Plowman, who's at University of Florida, who um, is using, and this, there's some data on this, using something called MEST therapy for breathing. Um, it helps people, I can't tell you exactly what it is, um, but it helps people not only with breathing, but with swallowing. Um, and uh, we're using a little bit of that. That's kind of new. Um, there's always new kinds of equipment coming out. There's new speech devices coming out all the time. I can tell you that the um, eye gaze system that comes out with like um, the Xbox and things like that, which is relatively inexpensive, is being used now in iPads and things. And um, that actually makes um, that a lot less expensive than buying a true eye gaze system like a Toby things like that. Um, so that's, the electronics is getting, is getting um, more sophisticated. Other than that, not really. Decide que le agradezco un montón, que su pasión está intacta por, 
por el mundo de la ELA, eh, que para nosotros, eh, este, bueno, para mí, para nosotros está, es un honor que sea nuestro amigo y contar con él, esperamos verlo pronto, no como los últimos encuentros que no lo vino, en Australia que no lo vimos y no me acuerdo si tampoco estuvo en el anterior, que nos vamos a tomar una cervecita, ¿sí? y, y bueno, que lo apreciamos mucho y que cuando podamos este, a, eh, avanzar con el proyecto de la capacitación profesional de UNELA con Emory, eh, lo haremos, y la idea mía es viajar a Estados Unidos cuando podamos ir, este, para cerrar un poco estos acuerdos con, con la Alianza y con la Ailes Association. Así que, eh, nada, este, estamos en contacto, mandar un abrazo grande, saludos a la familia, y, y nada, guardamos el mejor de los recuerdos de la visita acá y cuando nos vimos este, en los encuentros. ¿eh? All right, take care. It's good to see take you. Take care, you too. Thank you so much. Bye bye. See you next time. Bye, John. Say hi to your family. I will, you too. Ok, thank you so much. Bueno, gente, gracias. muchas gracias entonces gracias. por participar. Buenas noches. Nos vemos la próxima. Buenas noches, gracias. Gracias nuevamente. Gracias a todos. Saludos. Un abrazo grande.